If you are stolen, call the police at once. Hello and welcome to the China Podcast. This is our 10th recording, but officially it's not the 10th episode. If you listen to the one with the two French runners, I think it was about a month back, then you may have noticed that the episode title was kind of different. And there's a reason for that. We didn't list it as a sequential episode simply because we want the interviews to be standalone entities, which is why the recording that I speak of had no number and was titled The Expat Experience with So-and-So. Uh, and we love that idea. Um, they feel like little bonus episodes, like a little thank you note for showing your support and lathering us with love. And we will try to put out a regular episode the same week as an interview. Um, and through ACAST, we have the ability to set the date for publication, meaning we can pre-record and upload it to the website ahead of schedule. Making our life a little bit easier. Absolutely, yes. Less pressure. And we're probably going to do just that over the next month because we have the time. As long as we're not locked down and holed up in different places, that is. But yes, we plan on doing more interviews with expats in China. So hopefully you get to hear some of those this year. And the feedback to the last one was pretty positive. So it is clear that there's an audience who'd like to hear more chat between people who have a story to tell. Yeah, for, so for the time being, you are listening to episode nine. Now, one or two of you have been asking, what's our direction in terms of content? How do we decide what to talk about each week? And even, why don't we simply stick to the one kind of theme? So I think it's worth taking a few minutes now to kind of address these questions because we want to establish what we're all about, basically, uh, especially for any new listeners to the podcast. Okay, it's always a good idea to go back to the start just to get a feel of who we are and where we're going because this is a journey of sorts. If you're new to the podcast and your first experience was listening to some old Irish musician hanging out on the Great Wall of China with a velociraptor, then you'd be forgiven for wondering, what the fuck is going on? Yes, yes, you would. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, if you'd listened to the previous one, then you'd at least understand why we started off discussing a cultural exchange program involving Irish traditional music. The dinosaur stuff, that was the main topic of the podcast. And we're big advocates for blending everything together as best we can, even if it seems on the surface that there is no particular running theme per episode. Um, like, we don't just make this stuff up off the top of our heads. Yeah, that's exactly how it is, because we imagine we are the listener. How does it sound to somebody a thousand miles away? Are they receiving quality in return for their time, or is it just a load of old drivel? There are no little men sitting on our shoulders, whispering in our ears, telling us what to say next. But anyway, we're still a work in progress, and we're finding our voice and establishing our sense of direction. Right, so when we first told people, we, we know personally that we were thinking about making a podcast, uh, it was suggested that we should keep to the one theme, or at least one person told us that. Uh, now, there's a couple of things about why we don't. One, it's likely we'll always have a smaller audience in China. Uh, there aren't that yeah. many expats living here, fewer and even by the year. yeah, and even fewer of them will listen to to podcasts. Hmm. Uh, and our podcast is delivered in English in a country where Mandarin is the dominant tongue. Uh, and the other thing is, there's too, just simply too much to talk about. So, the best concept for for us was to keep it general, but importantly, keep it relevant. Keep it relevant, yeah, and. We'll find things that we find interesting. China is a, it's a happening place. There's no shortage of content. We have enough material lined up to last a good to six months, but stories always emerge in between. A lot of what we've intended to talk about has been put on the back burner for a little while longer because another story has came to light that might be hot off the press and is better investigating while it's still fresh. 
Which is great for us because we'll never run out of things to talk about. We can always put on a show. And that's what we've tried to focus on a little bit more of late. Current events. Uh, Westlife, dinosaur fossils. These stories made the news, not just in China, but abroad as well. Yeah. And in the spirit of going back to the start, well, not quite the start, a few podcasts ago, we spoke about cyberpunk. And since then, a new Matrix movie has been released. The fourth in the series called Matrix Resurrections. Yeah. Um, do you think some of the luster has worn off since the original was released? Because we're talking here about a seminal piece of work. Yeah, it's been a long, long time to wait for the next. Like it's mm, Decades. Yeah. yeah and, it's, and it's so hard to follow the first film because it was such a classic. The original Matrix was one of the finest cinematic works of science fiction ever. And they left the series open to revival. They said they weren't going to do it. And then they waited 20 years to do it. And they, I think they waited too long, to be honest. It's a good movie, but it's one for fans of science fiction and the series in particular, rather than just the general public. Yeah, so it doesn't really stand alone i mean you have to have had watched the previous ones right a hundred percent uh absolute 100 percent. the movie starts with references to the previous movies and without context you'd be completely lost mm. i vaguely remember the first films it was that long ago uh so what's the new one about anyway right okay you ready right we have in the modal which is a thing i'm not going to spoil there's a character by the name of morpheus and a few agents and they reenact trinity's escape while two new characters sequoia and bugs watch however as the false trinity escapes or almost escapes she is found by smith and bugs is caught by the agents so immediately if you don't know who trinity is you're at a loss i'm at a loss which one is trinity again trinity is carrie ann moss oh yeah yeah the one that runs, well, runs up the wall and stuff. Mm -hmm. So at the last minute, an agent and Bugs run into a room which resembles Neo's room at the beginning of the original Matrix. I know Neo. Yeah, he's Keanu Reeves, right? That is that is Keanu Reeves. Never ages, that guy. Um, fantastic human being, too. Yeah, there's an awful lot of pictures of him just, you know, chilling out on the New York subway and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, eating a sandwich in the park, feeding the birds and stuff. Yeah. Uh, he's just like, he gave somebody his, I think a homeless man, his jacket once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Middle of the winter and he you just know, gave that, him that's, a jacket. That's, that's who he is. He's just a nice guy. He doesn't like, yeah, he just likes being a normal New York yeah, he's just citizen, citizen. Like anybody world, else. Yeah. yeah. Except he's got a, a lot of money. In his <laughs> he's bank got account. a lot of money. Um, right. Anyway, I'll continue. So Bugs reveals to the agent that it was a vision of Neo that helped her to realize the truth and the entire premise of the franchise, leaving the new viewer again at a loss to know what she's talking about. Yeah, my memory is completely fuzzy on all those details. Um, so have you just given away now the entire plot of the, the new film? That's the first five minutes. Well, thank goodness for that, because... You know, I might fancy watching it one day. Um, so, yeah, it's really a continuation of a story that you must be invested in. Um, do you think there's a lot in it for the fans of the franchise? There is. You know, fans of the franchise are going to get what they what they expect from the movie. Yeah. Action from the start to the finish in a dystopian cyberpunk world, complete with rain and constant night. And the new characters are interesting. Remind me again, because... I didn't think cyberpunk was on the agenda this week. It's not. I'm leading with The Matrix because there's a boiling, a boiling hot story on the other side of all this that surfaced in China in the past week. But we first start with one of the main characters from the new Matrix, who is British with Asian ancestry, ancestry Jessica Henwick. She's an English woman with Singaporean, Chinese and African descent. Her father was actually born in Africa. He's a white guy. He, but he moved to England when he was 12. He's a pretty famous author, Mark Henwick. And, but she looks, for all intents and purposes, as if she's Chinese. 
She was in Game of Thrones and Star Wars, that, was she not? That is her, yeah, that's her. She played an X-Wing, X-Wing pilot in The Force Awakens. She actually had that part written for her by... Yeah, she, she tried out for the lead role mm, and okay. then she didn't get it and she had a part written in for her. Right, okay, yeah. yeah I, I know exactly now who you're, th- who you're talking about. Um, yeah, she's had a good run of recent success and she's making quite a name for herself in Hollywood. Um, she was the main character in a TV show called Iron Fist, where she played a martial artist who runs her own dojo. Um, and a lot of her work to date has involved a fair deal of martial arts, unless I'm mistaken. You're, you're right, it has. And it's something that she is very wary about. The idea that because she is Chinese, she can do Kung Fu. It's a stereotype that perpetuates within cinema and TV and can, from time to time, be borderline racist. Some people would see it as, as a trope, and it really is. Like, who else is going to run a dojo but a Chinese guy who's good at martial arts? Mm. That isn't really the problem. The problem arises when these are the only Asian characters you see in movies. Yeah. And, and Hollywood is, to this day, full of people who are white, tall, blonde, and incredibly attractive. Absolutely. Just watch the Oscars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's you know bleached teeth galore and if you aren't attractive enough to walk down a catwalk good luck trying to get a role in a movie bleached teeth (laughs) yeah did you ever look at it it's It's true it's true it's true um but yeah she's trying to to book that trend isn't she um she is yeah yeah, she because she recently starred in uh the new sophia coppola movie called Mm. on the rocks with bill murray Yep. Um, Bill Murray and Sophia Coppola they teamed the up a long time ago with yeah. Lost in Translation and we were we, we, we referred to that a yep. few weeks back um, and yeah so the sudden stardom has it's, it's come as, as a bit of, su- of a surprise to her um, one particular pinch me moment when the cast were filming On the Rocks in Mexico uh, what happened was Murray Bill Murray spontaneously serenaded her uh, and she said it was, to quote her, it was quite sweet. He told me the song was called Mexico. Uh, but I've looked it up and it doesn't sound like any of the songs I've found. So I don't actually know what it was. It's possible he just wrote it for me. <laughs> it, was, it was Bill Chance in his arm with a pretty young lady. I can understand that, yeah. Single man and everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Still old enough to be your grandfather, yeah, though. Yeah, he is. You know. What happens in Mexico stays in Mexico. YOLO. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Jessica Henwick's first role was in a BBC children's series called Spirit Warriors, uh, which was an adventure series based on Chinese myths and legends, and it starred an almost entirely ethnically Chinese cast, something that she was very aware of at the time. Following the conclusion of uh, Spirit Warriors, she spent a number of years choosing her roles and ensuring that her ethnicity had nothing to do with the actual character that she was portraying. Years later, the issue rose its head again when she was cast in Marvel's Iron Fist for Netflix. Uh, She eventually accepted the part, but only after making sure the character wouldn't be defined by her martial arts capabilities. Uh, She said, I love martial arts. I think it's beautiful. Um, But I just wanted to know that she was more than just that. Yeah, and it's like it's an obvious thing that Chinese actors would have to worry about was is that, you know, they're going to look at you, you're going to be Chinese and, you know, they'll put you doing martial arts. And that is stereotyping. And stereotyping is alive and well in Hollywood. And it needs people who are willing to stand up to it and ask the pertinent questions to ensure that the writers and the producers of these shows are held accountable for their actions. And I say, good for her, and I'm looking forward to seeing what she does next. And if she's in the company of Sofia Coppola and Bill Murray, she's not going to go too far wrong. No, um, and stereotypes, it can be a a very difficult thing to deal with. Um, And there are many, many, many stereotypes about China in Western media. there's a David Walliams short story. Maybe maybe you guys have heard about this. Um, he wrote a story about a Chinese boy um, which was removed from one of his children's books because of how it misrepresented Chinese culture. 
um, and this had to do with the character's name and simply how they were illustrated. And a Chinese podcaster, he called it out on his Instagram page um, and later an, an apology was um, yeah. issued. Um, but yeah, some stereotypes can be just plain nasty too. Like some people will hear that story and they'll say, oh, isn't a political correctness gone wrong? No, it's not. Mm. It's actually not. Like it's, it, yeah. it's offensive. And if it's offensive, you get rid of it. Yeah, it was offensive because the the character's name meant something else. And if you had a name like that and you're out on the playground, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. children are going, children going are to gonna be bullying you. you. Yeah, They're going yeah. to mock you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's why. And it was... It's uh, like something that would perpetuate yeah. around... Uh, and remember, it's a children's story. Mm. So it's going to perpetuate around schools and yeah. stuff like that. And the child was cast uh, or portrayed as... A nerd as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is another. Well, obviously, he's Chinese. You know. Well, there, there exactly is the stereotype, yeah. which this this podcaster didn't like, um, and so that's why it was removed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was saying that, you know, some stereotypes they can be just plain nasty, because if we look at Marvel, they recently had a movie banned here in China. Uh, it was called Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Um, and this was banned because of the character's origin story. And the problem with it, with the film, is its links to a guy called Fu Manchu, um, Shang-Chi's father in the original Marvel comics. Now, the character, which was created, the character being Fu Manchu, was created by white novelist Sax Romer, uh, who had never been to China. Um, and it's based on the racist idea of yellow peril whereby Chinese and Japanese people were a threat to the Western world. The character is considered the archetype of Western anti-Chinese sentiment. Yeah. Fu Manchu, is a, Fu Manchu is a story which originated, a character in a story which originated in the early 20th century, um, in a time when social Dar Darwinism and colour politics was at its height, a time when people believed in the primacy of races, he is an evil villain. He's a mad scientist and he's been portrayed by more than 90 years. And even if you don't know who the character is, you know the moustache. The thin, straight, long moustache which, dro which drops vertically at 90 degrees at the edge of the mouth. Thin eyes, funny hat. Very one. He's been played by Christopher Lee, Boris Karloff, Peter Sellers and even Sofia Coppola's cousin, Nicolas Cage. Um, he is the greatest actor of a generation, by the way. You obviously haven't seen his recent movies then. Well, he has to pay the tax man somehow. He has to pay the taxes somehow. Um, just watch Leave in Las Vegas and leave it there. Yeah. Uh, I, there's another thing, actually, Fu Manchu. Yeah. Um, those actors who, who've played him, yeah. how many of them have been Chinese? None. See? This is where we're going. This is what we're talking about here. Um, and they're all being dressed up in yellow. <clears throat> yes. So Fu Manchu is seen as the archetype of what has come to be known as the Yellow Peril, which we mentioned just now. Uh, it's a xenophobic racialist fantasy, basically. Um, and it was populari popularized by a man called Lolith Stoppard in his book, The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy which the New York Times reviewed as Loth, Lothrop Stoddard evokes a new peril, that of an eventual submersion beneath vast waves of yellow men, brown men, black men and red men, whom the Nordics have hitherto dominated. With Bolshevism menacing us on the one hand and race extinction through warfare on the other, many people are not unlikely to give Stoddard's book respectful consideration. And this all sounds like they were not exactly against the principles espoused in the book. It sounds as if they agreed with the sentiment. And the book is even mentioned in The Great Gatsby. Uh, it yeah. is, yep. It, it was, approvingly so. Uh, and in fact, it was one of the prevailing Western belief systems at the time. Uh, racialism, in this case, is sometimes called scientific racialism. Now, despite the name, it is a pseudoscience, 
But at the time, there was the belief in eugenic, eugenics, uh, separate evolutionary trees for different ethnicities and misappropriated anthropology. It was actually considered science. Um, yeah, it, it was. I mean, it's not now because like, we have DNA tests we, and a better understanding of anthropology. Uh, and, uh, people know that it is. It's simply bollocks. It is bollocks, yeah. Um, this is the same science or to be let's be correct this is the same pseudoscience like phrenology and all that measuring the size of your head this is the same stuff that led hitler to believe that the germans were a part of the master race and it has been so completely debunked now that anthropologists now accept that race it race the idea of someone being black or white or yellow that exists purely as a social construct there is no white race there is no black, yellow, brown, or any, any of those different races mm. that are based on color. They don't exist. They are all just ethnicities, according to science. But as with all social constructs, people's perception can change over time. Um, and it takes a strong voice to bring this to the forefront, uh, which is hopefully something that we can see more of in the future. Yeah, just last, last year, we saw one of the biggest movements to date dealing with these issues in the case of George Floyd. Yeah. Um, it was a black man who was murdered by the police officer Derek Chauvin. Mm -hmm. In America. And it sparked mass protests all over the world, um, making people question what they think race is. Yeah, it's good. Uh, and I'd like to think that we're all learning more and more each day. Um, but it, it's still, it's still there. It's, it's still a massive problem worldwide that we must tackle. Um, I mean, you just look at the state of football. Um, Maybe someday we'll just cop on to ourselves. Yeah, maybe we will. Maybe we will. Anyway, boiling hot story time. Did you see the recent furore surrounding the advertisements for Three Squirrels Snack Foods? That's the name of the company, by the way. Yeah, odd story, um, given that the target of all the abuse was Chinese. Uh, and it's something to do with their appearance, right? Yeah. Now, for me, there are three interesting things about the whole issue i saw it immediately and 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 i thought that's that's not right you know people don't really think that do they so i started asking questions and i asked every chinese woman that i saw the same question really simple what do you think of this picture all right you were on quite the mission then weren't you <laughs> what what did what did they think of it anyway these 26 women yeah well they unanimously said what about it you know just what about it it's an ad they, they felt no way one way or the other but they almost all said that they didn't consider her attractive well i asked one woman that i know and on the contrary she considered her very attractive uh but she she as well has been exposed to western lifestyles so maybe has another take on what beauty is you mean to say that you only know one woman I'm a shy going lad. <laughs> Although, yeah, my friend did state that it was more a case of the company using a Western stereotype of Asian people, uh, which was more the problem, I suppose. Yeah, yeah that is the problem. Uh, you know? And that is an interesting point of view uh, that we will get into in a few minutes. Um, but yes, what were the other two things that okay. interest you? So the other two things, the next one is that when pushed, and I asked them about the aesthetics of the picture. Um, they almost all said that she was, what she was wearing, the hat she was wearing, um, it was stereotypical and they didn't like it. Yes, in one of the pictures, uh, she's shown serving a bowl of noodles with one of those conical straw hats that you associate with, with farmers uh, and rural fishermen. Uh, you you know the picture. That's the one you that I the showed pictures. them. Yeah, that's the one I showed. Them. They're they're shaped like a like a triangle, like a yeah. pyramid kind of thing. Little little cone sort of a job. Yeah, yeah, more yeah. like a cone, I suppose. Yeah. Um, that's the picture I showed them. That's yeah. that's the one. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's cool. And right. So, what was the other thing that stood out to you? Right. The other thing that stood out to me was this was this advertisement. Even though this hit the news and it was on the BBC, you know, in like last week. Yeah. This is an advertisement for 2019. Mm, that's something I didn't know. 
before when I saw it I saw alright this just, yeah. just, just happened so we're talking the end of 2021 so it's gone through most of 2019 uh-huh. all of 2020 yeah and 11 months of 2021 alright this has been used for over two years and all this hullabaloo was started by a bunch of keyboard warriors who probably bought a pot noodle and they didn't like it. So they didn't like the flavour, then decided that's racist. That's, I'm going to try that the next time I get, get some bad food in the restaurant. How was your food, sir? You're racist. Close your shop and never open it again. <laughs> Right, yeah. And I suppose that is one of the biggest issues facing this model right now um, because she has been attacked online for, quote, uglifying China, um, which is the phrase that has been bandied about. It's horrible, man. It's horrible. Some of the abuse that she has received online is, has been completely unwarranted. Yeah. People have said that she's feeding into <clears throat> the Western stereotypes that Chinese people have slanted eyes some have accused the brand of using her makeup to make her eyes appear more slanted. Mm. And she was just doing her job. Just doing just what doing she was her job. told to do. Yeah. Um, and the, the three squirrel squirrels company, um, they denied this and have stated that they use makeup to accentuate her natural features with no intention whatsoever to make her look ugly. But despite this, they were still forced to issue an apology, saying, quote, regarding the opinion that the model does not fit the mainstream's aesthetic taste and makes the public feel uncomfortable, we are sincerely sorry. But does that cut the mustard? The Muppets Online said some awful things to her. Uh, they've been accu- they even accused her of being deliberately offensive and unpatriotic. Now, yeah, this is the thing. And let's remember here what we are talking about. It's a woman, a model, who simply did her job and she has now been accused of being unpatriotic because of her appearance. Yeah, and do you know what? She stood her ground. She's fighting back on fighting back on Weibo saying, mm-hmm. am I disqualified to yeah. be Chinese just because I have small eyes? I was born with these eyes. And they look even smaller in real life. Does that mean I can't be a model? Have I been offensive to Chinese people since the day I was born? And she continued saying for people online that they're creating big problems out of normal matters. And it has become a morbid obsession. Yeah, fighting words. And I agree with her. Me too. Um, Yeah, and the brand themselves, while apologizing, uh, they've noted that they were trying to make the advertisement in a Guo Chao style. Now, for those of you who listen to the cyberpunk podcasts, uh, you will be familiar with the cool Japan phenomenon, where Japan addressed stereotypes by presenting Japan in a very cool light. Um, Guo Chao is the Chinese equivalent. Guo Chao means national or country's trend. Um, it sees a movement of consumers who are embracing China's nationalism, driven by a notab- noticeably increased quality in products, branding, and marketing. The term came about circa 2018 when sportswear brand Li Ning showcased a collection at the Paris Fashion Week, which created quite the stir in the fashion world. I have some Li Ning shoes. They're quite comfy. The left one's a bit shorter than the right, though. <laughs> mm, yeah, let's get that. Did you book buy it cancelled. online? Did you? Did you, you didn't try them on them beforehand? No, no, no. no. Bought online. Yeah, hope for the best. I'm about to get that book taken out of the the libraries. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In all aspects, Guo Chao banks on everything explicitly Chinese, from traditional motifs to iconic imagery that resonate with China and Chinese people. Uh, while Western brands have often marketed social status, Guo Chao appeals with social identity, personal belief, and national pride to shift appeal and win over consumers. It is a formula that's working especially with a new generation of Chinese youths who are born and raised in an environment that actively promoted nationalism. Guo Chao differs somewhat from Cool Japan 
in that it is also a fairy tale like element to its artistic direction, uh, often steering away from the ultra modern and the contemporary and returning instead to a slower, older time and place, a kind of older sense of China. Mm. Um, and it reminisces the, yeah, the lived experience of China in the 90s and the early noughties, often leaning towards backdrops of the countryside and or mythical landscapes. Um, some brand identities even go all the way back to the days of imperial China. We see this a lot. Yeah. Uh, and this is a period particularly popular in local Chinese television. Yeah. Uh, Lisa Chi was all into that before she fell off the face of the planet. Um, but the ad in question also had images of Mao on the bowl and, and the cup, which people found offensive. Netizens even went so far as to assert that the three squirrels had broken the law by using the image of Mao in the advertisements. But it's worth mentioning that not all of the responses to the advertisement have been negative. In fact, the commenters are split on the issue of the model. Some of the comments are, I don't think her eyes are small in her ordinary photos and videos, so why did she squint in the advertisement? The intention behind the photo is what should be slammed. Okay, so yeah. people have the common sense to direct that kind of their kind of anger or their disagreement towards, towards the company. The, the company, the company yeah. not her. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they also think she looked beautiful in the advertisement. And it's not necessary to say, to say that she's unpatriotic. Um, can't our culture just be tolerant and confident, said one person. Slanted eyes is also a kind of Eastern beauty. Yeah. The definition for beauty should not be limited to big eyes and double eyelids. And those are the comments that I would call sensible. But yeah, I feel bad for the woman. I can't see it being very easy for her to get work in the future. The next company that looks to hire her will be very aware of who she is and the interest that's going to be generated by having her in advertisements. Yeah, but you know, cancel culture can be, can be very toxic. Yeah, not all publicity <clears throat> is good publicity here in China. Um, but this brings up the question of what is beautiful in China. What are the physical features that Chinese people value? Yes, because what you and I might consider handsome or beautiful may not be what is considered attractive to the people of China. Can you describe a beautiful woman to me? What makes someone beautiful to you? Physical characteristics now. Right, let's see. Um, Striking features. All right. A warm smile is always good. That's good, yeah. Uh, but then, you know, I've travelled around a little bit. Um, I've seen many varieties of beauty. And there are many varieties there of sure beauty. There sure are, yeah. yeah. It's a pretty hard <laughs> question. There are loads of varieties of beauty. Um, it's a pretty hard question to answer, really. Now, picture being Ch Chinese and living in a very homogenous country. How do you think they consider beauty? What is beautiful to a Chinese person and to the Chinese people? Well, they actually have a very clear idea of what beauty is. One of the things you will notice first in China is in the soap aisle of your local supermarket. Soaps are made usually containing whitening agents to, in effect, bleach the skin and make it appear whiter. Yeah, and this actually dates back over 2000 years, skin tone was an indicator to the early Chinese of social class. The lighter the skin tone, the whiter you were, the less manual labor you had to do, and thus the higher class you were. Uh, yeah, and it's actually the biggest market for whitening products in the world. Yeah, it's pretty hard for a pasty Irishman to find some soap. If I use those products, I turn translucent. Yeah, they're, they're of no use to us. <laughs> no use to us, yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, skinniness, right? Skinniness is also an ideal that is revered in China. Whereas in the West, fitness is kind of favored over obesity. Uh, in China, it's not the muscle tone that is ideal. It is the sheer slenderness. Yeah, and over the years, there have been various internet challenges which have been linked to the idea of slenderness. I remember the A4 challenge. Women were challenged to hold and share photos of themselves with an A4 piece of paper in front of their waist to show that they were thinner than the width of the piece of paper. Now, understandably, 
This sparked a lot of controversy with the challenge being accused of promoting unhealthy lifestyles. Some women hit back at it by posting photos of themselves with their degrees held up in front of their waist instead. Starving yourself isn't a challenge. Starving yourself while spending four years in lecture halls is. Yeah, there's two different classes of people there. Another challenge involving paper was a viral trend where women were wrapping 100 UN notes round their wrists to show how skinny they were. Uh, some women took the trend even further by wrapping even smaller banknotes around their wrists. Yeah, they were the poorer ones. They didn't have the 100 UN to wrap, so they just wrapped the 50. Mm. Yeah. Or the, the emo. The emo, yeah. Can you? Oh, Jesus. Can you that's imagine? Tiny. That's like... A, third the size of a hundred you and not oh it would be yeah easily can you imagine being able to put that around your wrist uh, that that would not be healthy not we'll even have close. to try it out now after this yeah <laughs> <laughs> see who's skinnier well when, we know who is when was the last time you saw an emo note uh i think i have one in my wallet oh i have a few but i haven't seen one in, no, in so long you, you, yeah people don't use cash anymore yeah or less less, less, of, less yeah. of i try to you know, just keeping people honest in the shops. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's why they were so skinny. They couldn't afford food, as you were saying. <laughs> yeah. And then there's the, the iPhone knees challenge. Uh, in this one, Chinese women, they put pictures of themselves with an, an iPhone 6 balanced on top of their knees to show their pencil-thin legs. Um, and women who could successfully hide their knees behind the phone were deemed to have the ideal standard of leg. I reckon I could manage that with a Galaxy Note. I think I could do it with, a, with about a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, finally, another challenge. Uh, this one involved coins uh, on the collarbone. Yeah. That's what it was called. Coins, coins on, on the, the collarbone. Bone. The challenge. coins on the collarbone um, challenge. And this was to prove one's skinny figure. Uh, women were balancing stacks of coins standing upright on their collarbones. The more coins you could balance, supposedly the better figure you should have. Or some kind of nonsense like yeah, that. Yeah, like, yeah. Like ba the clavicle, the chest bone, you know? Yeah. You know, you know that bit there? Uh -huh. And they'll just kind of rest them pointing up the way. Mm. Mm. So, I, mean, I mean, some people, they were, yeah, they were able to balance as many as 20 coins, which, although probably says nothing about how you look, it does show that you have very good balancing skills. Yeah. I can imagine there were a few coins lost on the backs of couches in China after that one. Yeah. And interestingly enough, these beauty norms, they're not entirely gender specific. Yeah, because men with a, with a slim build, they're preferred to, in fact, in recent years, more of an effeminate look has become more and more popular with the rise of Xiaoxian Rou, which basically means fresh little meat. And this slang describes a new generation of male Chinese heartthrobs who look androgynous. Yeah, they, that's right. Yeah, they look androgynous. That's right. Yeah. And, well, and then, of course, you have, you know, all the, the, the filters on your apps. Oh, yeah, the beauty apps the and, beauty and apps, whatnot. Yeah. 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 I'm sure I was sitting outside having a... Um, having fish one day um with one of my chinese friends and he takes a picture and of course there's a filter on it and it's uh -huh. a beauty filter yeah and it literally turned my f changed the face of my shape and just made it pure white just white as a ghost and then he posted that and i was going why did you take why did you even take that picture yeah even, even these apps come with whitening agents yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> But we, yeah, you know, we haven't even spoken about people's faces yet. And yeah, like you're kind of saying there, the shape of people's faces is an indicator of beauty in China. Uh, and they have names for the different types of faces, right? Yeah, they do, yeah. Uh, some being more sought after than others. Uh, and there's stereotypes for those face shapes too. We'll probably mess up the pronunciation uh, as we're reading these out, but we'll give it a go anyway. Yeah. Guadalian. That's a melon seed face. It's an oval shaped face um, where guaza means melon seeds. And you ready? Because they all have a stereotype attached to them. It's viewed to be the most beautiful type of face by traditional Chinese beauty standards. 
And if you have ever seen a melon seed, that's what it looks like. O Dan Lien, goose or goose egg face. Uh, this one is very similar to the melon seed face uh, and is similarly sought after. Yeah. Chang Lian. Chang Lian, a long face, which is me, mm-hmm. according to my wife. <laughs> All right. Chinese think that women with long faces look rational, concealed, and full of wisdom. But they're also easy to give people a somber or arrogant impression. Mm, somber and arrogant that doesn't sound like you at all i know how can i be arrogant when i'm perfect yeah but why the long face because <laughs> i'm a horse <laughs> <laughs> you probably eat like a horse oh. uh here's another one dao san jiao xing lian or inverted triangle shape face this face shape used to be an iconic beauty standard back in the 90s Chinese people think it exudes a charming, a soft, delicate, and unique temperament. But it's also easy to leave a thin, mean impression. That's my wife. That's my wife's face, yeah. Thin, mean impression. Yeah, that's her. I was going to make a joke there, but now but I won't. No. Well, you can make it it when we're off the radio. Yeah. yeah. Right. There's another term for that in Western media. Yeah. Um, Yuan Lian, or Baozi Lian which is a round face or a steam bun face, Chinese people say that women with this type of face, they look lively and cute. And you get an impression that it is easy to become friends with them. Yet at the same time, they might be childish and naive. Yeah, and there's one thing about that. Yeah, but I've heard uh, people in China, particularly women, women that I, I know, and I, I do mo- I do know more than one own. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd imagine so. <laughs> um, and yeah, they subscribe to this one. This is Ooh. one I'm very familiar with. Yes. Uh, totally yeah. subscribe to it. If they see a face that they don't know, he looks like a friendly he looks guy. Friendly. Or yeah. she looks friendly. Yeah. They look, they look like the type of person that I would like to get on with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And they, and they literally, they judge and people. It's very interesting. They're... And do you know what? Yeah. I'd say 99% of the time they are right. <laughs> do you think so? Yeah, yeah. No, I do. I do. I do. Yeah. And when they see someone that maybe looks kind of mean. Yeah. Uh, and they haven't met them. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But then li- maybe you know the person. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah, you can uh, you can agree with that because okay. I might say, you know what, actually they are mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but here's another one. And it's called Fong Lian or square face. Uh, From the Chinese point of view, this type of face gives a strong impression. It is a perfect combination of charming beauty and a strong personality. However, many women themselves believe that this face shape doesn't seem to be very gentle. Yeah. And all of those, they all sound like you're reading horoscopes. But you know something? It's amazing how different countries view beauty and how beauty changes over time. Well, if you think about the beauty standard during the Middle Ages, big was beautiful. And some girls were bigger than others. Morrissey has entered the building. (laughs) And some girls' mothers were bigger than other girls' Uh, mothers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's true. It's true. This this was uh, a fact of the Middle Ages. Um, And it was presented... Uh, in some of the finest works of art ever produced. Uh, And there's a reason why so many paintings from hundreds of years ago portray larger nude women as the main focus. I mean, think about it. This was the beauty standard of the time. Yeah, and even in the Tang Tang Dynasty in China, plump women, they were desirable. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... In the last 20 years in the West, we've seen a shift in beauty standards. Um, 1990s, right? In the 1990s, being skinny was all the rage, even going, going as far as heroin chic, if you remember that. Um, if you were a model or a pop star and you weren't slim, you weren't going to make it. Kate Moss was the fashion face of what uh, Tony Blair called Cool Britannia. Now, she was super slim, and she had to be that way. Yeah, and I'm sure that's still the practice in the modeling world today, but certainly in the world of pop music, that's no longer the case. 
if you take someone, for example, like Nicki Minaj, yeah, it definitely isn't. Definitely not. No. Um, even the likes of Billy Billy Eilish or Lana Del Rey. Eilish, yeah, yeah, yeah. Billy Eilish. Yeah. I don't know her that well. I don't listen to her music. We got Eilish and Eilish in Ireland. We got Eilish yeah, and that's, Eilish. That's why. That's the that's, that's the mix the, up. That's the mix up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, healthy women. Billy Eilish. Yeah. Right. Billy Eilish. Bad boys. Eilish, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not Eilish. Billy yeah. Eilish um, and Lana Del Rey. I mean, these are two of what you might call healthy women. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. Very popular. Very, very popular yeah. for their music. Oh, they're great, and they're, and and they're great for body standards and and yeah. for you know. Mm. For young women, not having having to appeal to a beauty standard, yeah. it might be a they're million not they're more. not big or anything. By the they're way, they're not big. They're, but they don't want to be skinny. Women. Yeah, they're they're healthy. Just yeah, they're good looking women. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and who knows where the beauty standard is going to be? Where where's the which direction the future might take? Yes, um, we're going to leave it there. We're going to sign off now. Yeah, be sure to follow us on Twitter at the China Podcast. Send us an email, like and subscribe on YouTube. Give us a follow wherever you are listening. We do love hearing your feedback. It can only make us better. Yeah, Spring Festival is coming up and we're looking forward to getting out and seeing some things and having a few new experiences. There's talk of go-karting and skiing amongst uh, some of our friends. And then there are the alligators and the art exhibitions. Yeah, there's lots of things to do. And lots of things to see. And with that, we'll leave you for another week. Toodles.